Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Rosemary, U.S. Access Board. Uh, today is January 13th, um, and this is the full meeting of the U.S. Ar Architectural and Transportation Barriers Compliance Board. Chairing this meeting is Mr. Lance Robertson from HHS. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Rosemary, and hello to everybody. Uh, welcome to the January meeting of the U.S. Access Board. And we're so pleased that you could join us this afternoon. As Rosemary indicated, I'm Lance Robertson and I serve as a chair of the U.S. Access Board. I represent the Department of Health and Human Services on the board as the Assistant Secretary for Aging and the head of the Administration for Community Living at HHS. <clears throat> the board normally meets um, in person, of course, and live streams its meetings online. But of course, as we all know, since the pandemic, um, the board continues, of course, to convene but doing so now remotely. So on behalf of my colleagues on the board, I welcome you to this virtual meeting of the board and it's first of the new year. And today we are using the Zoom webinar platform. So depending on what kind of uh, device you're on and what type of device you're using, you may have the option to adjust viewing settings on your screen. And if you're able to adjust the settings, we recommend setting your screen to side-by-side -side gallery view. Again, depending on your device, you may uh, not have that option to adjust your view. Our meeting today features a presentation on an important and timely subject, ensuring access to virtual meeting platforms so that they are inclusive for everyone. And this will be followed by committee reports and other board business. I understand the staff have already taken a roll through the meeting platform, so we're going to proceed with the first item on the agenda, which is the executive director's report. As all of you likely know, David Capozzi, the board's longtime executive director, retired last June. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce Dr. Sachin Pavathran as the agency's new executive director. Uh, Sachin was named to the position in December after an extensive, and I'll say exhaustive, uh, selection process. Um, he had served as a member of the board since 2012, and I've had the honor of working with him as a fellow board member for the past four years. He previously served terms as chair and as vice chair of the board. He also was active in the board's update of its section 508 standards for information and communication technology in the federal sector. For the past 10 years, Sachin served as the program director of the Utah Assistive Technology Program and as a director of policy for the Center for Persons with Disabilities at Utah State University. He has over 20 years of experience developing and testing assistive technology and has lectured and trained extensively on this subject. So I understand Sachin that uh, you're joining us today from Logan, Utah, and that you'll be moving to the DC area later in the year. And I wanna welcome you to your first board member as executive director. Sachin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, January board meeting. It is an honor to play this role as the new executive director. You know, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your service uh, as the chairman of this board. This, uh, I understand you've been the chairman twice so far, but also for your service uh, at ACL under HHS. We appreciate all the work you have done, and I've had the opportunity to work with you on a, in my previous employment and appreciate all the work you have done you know, for improving service for people with disabilities. Um, so this, uh, I started my new role as the executive dir director a couple of weeks ago, and I do have to say I'm very honored to have this position. Uh, David Capozzi, as you all know, has uh, played the role of as executive director for the last decade or more, and it's a it's big shoes to fill, and I'm excited for the opportunity. I'm also very excited to work with a great team of people within the access board who have expertise and who really are passionate about the work that we do to make uh, this world more accessible. I'm also uh, looking forward to working with my colleagues who I, uh, you know, as public members and federal liaisons to do the work that we've been uh, assigned to do. With that said, um, I have a quick report for, uh, for all of you with what the agency has been up to. 
you know, tw uh, 2020 has been an interesting year in many ways with the pandemic. We have had to uh, adjust and change a lot of uh, ways how we approach business. Uh, I do want to recognize the team at the Access Board for the quick transition to, on, to doing remote working and but also making sure our services and the work we do does not come to a halt. Um, I, I want to recognize the pe uh, staff that has helped uh, agency uh, personnel to transition over and also make sure that we are meeting the goals that have been charged uh, for us to meet. Um, a couple of the things that we have accomplished in the last year. Um, you know, we all our public board meetings have transitioned to um, online service like we're doing today. But uh, s some of the things that we accomplished, our new website that was rolled out in November, which if you haven't seen that yet, please do take time to visit our new website, which has, uh, has great new features and has a lot of improvements and we've got, we've received a lot of good feedback for it. But if you have ideas and thoughts, please do send it our way. We are always looking ways to improve on that. Um, our webinars still uh, continued. We've had, we still continue to do all the online webinars and we still get a lot of traction on that. Um, even though we're not doing in-person trainings, we have successfully transitioned into online trainings and we've uh, in fact, we have trained 20% more than the previous year by doing these online uh, uh, trainings. Our technical assistance service, which is a key component of uh, what we do at the agency has uh, continued and without any interruptions. And uh, I wanna show appreciation to the staff who provide those technical assistance uh, for, for our community. Um, our, and we also are continuing to issue guidance to our ADA and ABA standards and enf uh, enforcing the Architectural Barriers uh, Act. So in the last couple of months, since October to uh, mid-December, we have received about 28 complaints in regards to our ABA uh, enforcement, and uh, we have addressed about 27 of those. Um, so it's, it's very no noticeable that our work is continuing forward and we are doing what we've been charged to do to make sure any uh, issues that come up is being addressed. Um, we, we are also working on a study to, um, we are proceeding to do a study on wheelchair securement for aircrafts and that's that study is being continued right now. So this is a sampling of things that has happened over the last year in spite of everything that has happened um, during the pandemic. It's, it's very clear the staff, everyone who's part of the agency, including the role the public members and the federal liaison place, the work is being done with the access board. We, you know, we are moving forward, finding new ways to address various uh, you know accessibility things that come up and we've we are also finding new ways to make sure we get information out to uh, all those who find uh, value in in the work that we do with that said um, i do want to show my appreciation again for this great opportunity i'm excited to play this role as the executive director and i also want to show appreciation to all the public members and federal liaison uh, who uh, found confidence in me to play this role. Uh, with that, I turn my time back to you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Sachin, for your report and uh, your leadership, dedication, and expertise will serve you well in this new position. And we wish you all the best in leading the agency into its, into its next chapter. Uh, the board also wishes to express its appreciation to Gretchen Jacobs for serving as interim executive director after David's retirement. Uh, Gretchen very capably managed the agency in that role while at the same time maintaining all of her duties as general counsel for almost six months. I know that meant a lot of uh, long days, extra hours and work filled weekends. And on behalf of the board, I thank you for your dedication and uh, really am grateful for all that you did, Gretchen. 
So I would now like to uh, call upon board member, um, board member uh, Howard Rosenblum is going to introduce our guest speakers for today's presentation. So Howard, the floor is now yours, sir. So thank you to the chair. And I also would like to recognize Gretchen Jacobs. Much appreciation for the efforts that she undertook. And to welcome Sachin Pavithran in his, his new position as executive director. I'm very much looking forward to working with Sachin in that capacity. We are now about to host a presentation on accessible meeting platforms. As you may know, the wide scale virtualization of meetings, conferences, trainings, and myriad other events over the past year due to the pandemic raises important considerations for accessibility and for inclusion. So today's presentation will provide for you all an overview of both the technological developments for accessible online meetings and platforms, as well as logistic best practices that improve the accessibility and usability of these remote events and virtual platforms for all. To that end, our speakers today are Brandon Pace and Gerard Williams. Brandon, first of all, is the Enterprise Application Administrator in the Office of Accessible Systems and Technology at the US Department of Homeland Security, DHS. In that position, he provides strategic direction and leadership for both technical support and reasonable accommodations to ensure the disabilities have equal access to information and data. He's also the president of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing DHS Employee Resource Group, the ERG. And he speaks frequently on accessibility and requirements of the re program access and information and communication technology. 504 Compliance Officer at the Federal Communications Commission. Gerard coordinates and ensures access to commission programs and services under the Rehab Act. He's also a certified ASL English interpreter. As a member of the Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division's Disability Outreach Team, he has routinely participated in such events as the Chairman's Award for Advancement in Accessibility, and the FCC civics class. Members of the audience who would like to submit questions to our speakers can do so via the QA feature of the Zoom platform. So if you have a question, please type it into the question box and our speakers will attempt to address those questions as they can throughout the presentation. they will address whatever questions they can, time permitting. Once that is concluded, we will have questions from the board, public members and federal liaison, and then open to questions from audience members attending. With that, Gerard and Brandon, over to you. I believe we are ready to start the screen share for the PowerPoint presentation portion. Uh, in the meantime, thank you for that very kind introduction, Howard. Uh, Brandon and I will do our best to live up to those high expectations, although we both do a little bit better with a lower bar, but we will, we will do our best. Uh, so as was said, we're here to present about accessible virtual meetings. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide unless Brandon wants to add any more on that. No, we can go ahead and go on to the next slide. 
And uh, I think we may be able to move past our introductions, given that Howard was far more gracious in his introductions of either of us than we were likely to be uh, of ourselves. And that brings us to our agenda. So we just wanna quickly talk about what we're going to cover today. And I'm gonna go through that really quickly. Uh, we are going to start out talking about accommodations versus accessibility, uh, not versus in terms of a boxing match, but instead the comparison between and how those things are similar, different, often misunderstood to be the same thing. We're going to talk about the challenges and opportunities that are presented by moving to fully virtual environments. Uh, those are the pros and cons of moving to virtual platforms. And then we'll get into some best practices for how meetings are working in order to overcome some of the inherent weaknesses of moving to entirely virtual platforms. At that point, we will start to get into some equipment and technology recommendations, uh, both for your individual setup, recommendations for individuals who are participating in a meeting, uh, but we will also then move into talking about specific platforms. Uh, and since we've skipped our introductory slide, I have to back us up, Brandon, because we failed to do our standard federal disclaimer, but now is probably the time. Uh, so Brandon and I will be talking about named products and named platforms. It's very important for us to express that none of our remarks should be construed or interpreted to be an endorsement by either our agencies or the federal government writ large for any given product or service. I also need to make sure that it is communicated. I am not an attorney at the FCC. I do not represent any legal opinions by the FCC uh, about the various states of accessibility or feature sets or any jurisdiction over any of these things. So please take that with a grain of salt. We're here to talk about some pragmatics of how this stuff works in practice. Uh, so we would ask that you keep your understanding of our remarks in that vein and know that we are not officially endorsing any of these products. But the products we do plan to go through are Zoom, which we find ourselves on today, Cisco WebEx, Google Meet, Adobe Connect, Microsoft Teams, uh, and lastly, a broader category of product that is live streaming, uh, distinct from some of the meeting platforms, the live streaming platforms. And for those, you can think of things like YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, these mechanisms by which your meetings can be streamed to a larger audience. And then we've saved the best for last. At the end, we will talk about how you can pick a platform, and then we will take some questions. Brandon, did you want to add anything? No, I didn't want any, add anything before going to the next slide, no. So for this slide, I want to be able to share this incredibly powerful quote. I think that it brings a new level of understanding for, for um, people. So for most people, technology makes things easier. For people with disabilities, however, technology makes things possible. And this was a quote by Mary Pat Rodenbaugh, who was the director of IBM's National Support Center for People with Disabilities in 1988. So this slide here that we're moving on to. Uh, and well, Brandon is going to go through the, the text of this slide, but I also want to make sure that for those of you who may not be able to see the slide, that we do a quick description of some of the images that we've used here. So we have a three panel image at the top of this with three words, left to right, equality, accommodation, and accessibility. Uh, that first under equality, we see a chalkboard that's raised up uh, relatively high and three individuals attempting to all write on it. Uh, we've got someone who of sort of moderate but relatively short height who's straining to reach up to write on it, someone who is taller, comfortably reaching up to write on it, uh, and someone who is using a walker or a wheelchair device who is below the keyboard and unable to reach it. That's under equality. Under accommodation, again, the same image, the same three people, uh, but the shorter individual is now standing on a raised platform to be able to reach it. And we have a ramped platform for the individual who's using uh, the walker wheelchair. And then the last image under accessibility, is it's a much simpler. The chalkboard has been enlarged and moved down. And now everyone can reach it from right where they are. 
and that is under the word accessibility. And now I'll turn it over to Brandon and talk through some of the content. Thank you, Gerard, for that explanation of the visual. And so the pictures that are here are demonstrating clearly that accommodation is not the same as accessibility. Accommodation is for the individual who has a disability, who needs a specific uh, accommodation for them, and that's a reactive. Whereas accessibility is not reactive, but it's much more inclusive. Um, and it means that things are available and ready to go from, from the get, from the very start of, of all of it, um, instead of reacting to something later on down the process. So therefore, accessibility and content of such um, is really important from the onset. And accessibility is our goal, but accommodation are tools that can be used to help people um, to have access to information and those are just the tools with which to reach um, that. Gerard, did you want to add anything before we move on to the next slide? Yeah, just briefly, um, we are trying to get through our content fairly quickly today so that we can take plenty of questions. Uh, and at the end, we do have a link to a longer version of this presentation that we gave uh, as part of the Access Board speaker series. Uh, and there we provided a list of common in-person accommodations. Uh, and the idea here is we're trying to find ways that we can translate accommodations that are towards the goal of accessibility from an in-person real world space into a virtual space and there are challenges and opportunities that go along with that and with that i think that we can move to the next slide <laughs> excuse me before we do i wanted to talk about kinds of accommodations we would be looking at asl interpreters we would be looking at cart we would be looking at automated captioning and um, ssp if you could go back to the this previous slide there we go One of the things that, that, you know, talking about different kinds of accommodations that are related directly to this particular slide would be, again, things like ASL or CART, which you see on the screen that we have today, um, automated captioning, uh, accessible documents and the like, uh, Braille, large print materials, note taking, extended breaks for people who are wheelchair users who need bio breaks and need a little bit more time to navigate that. So um, sometimes people who need to sit in the front row to be able to see the interpreter more clearly, those are some of the things that we're talking about this. Now I'm ready to go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. This is Gerard. So we've got virtual meetings and we're starting out with the challenges. First and foremost, platform limitations, technical challenges. So any of these platforms that we're talking about are a virtual facsimile that's trying to approximate our in-person experience. And those things are all perforce going to be limited. And everyone experiences that regardless of disability, but it does have an outside impact on people with disabilities. We also have environmental limitations in terms of what tools are available to people, whether those be security based uh, tools. So there are some limitations to what types of platforms may be allowed to be used, what types of platforms are affordable and what levels they're affordable at, which leads into licensing limitations. So there are some platforms that have a licensure model wherein you have to subscribe to a certain level in order to get access to features. And some of those features may have either direct or ancillary accommodation and accessibility benefits, but unless you are able to subscribe to that higher license, you may not have those uh, features and functions available. The next one is a big one, diverse access methods uh, and user interfaces or UI. Uh, so when we're all in person, one can expect with some fidelity to know what our experience is going to be. Of course, it's going to vary depending on disability, but we know that we can control the environment where we are. Uh, when you are working virtually, there are so many more variables that come into play. For example, whether you're joining via mobile device, how large is the screen of the device on which you are joining? Does that have a limited feature set based on its operating system? Are you updated to the most recent version? Do you have access to all the features? Those are all things that are on the end users 
uh, computer or device end that as a meeting host, I don't even necessarily have visibility into. And so in some ways, the best we can do is what was done at the beginning of this meeting to explain that it would be best if you were able to, for this meeting, enable side-by-side -side mode that was going to give you an optimal user experience. But if you were uh, using a mobile device, you may not have access to that. So that diverse method of access causes some problems and causes some uncertainty in what the user experience is going to be like. There's also a limited ability to provide technical support. So in this meeting, for example, uh, we have somewhere on the order of five to 600 attendees at this moment. Uh, and it is very challenging for us to try to be able to manage individually the experience given all of those variables. So we have, I have seen, and I apologize to those of you who've been sending questions in the Q&A that are about your experience in this meeting, because I would desperately love to be able to help you. But Howard is also expecting me to do a great presentation, and I can't disappoint Howard. Uh, so we have real challenges in trying to support our users, whereas if we were doing a meeting in person, we have some understanding of what is going on in our common shared space. Plus, if I'm trying to give one-on-one -on -one support to people, I don't know what their screen looks like. I'm not sure what device they're connected on. Me being able to communicate with them may depend on them having access to the tool we're trying to fix. So it gets very confusing very quickly. We also, of course, have turn-taking awkwardness. We are all at least certainly sighted people, hearing people, but generally everyone is relying on some amount of in-person cues. Blind individuals are relying on auditory cues. Uh, hearing individuals are relying on auditory and visual cues. Deaf people are relying on visual cues. Deaf blind people may be relying on tactile cues and tactile information. When we are all separate, we lose access to all of those tools in order for us to effectively navigate our conversation. And as a linguistics nerd, that's the perfect nightmare uh, for trying to figure out when is the time for me to be able to get the floor. So Brandon and I have scripted when we are going to take our turns very, very precisely. And we still said that we were going to add in at the end of every slide, each of us is going to say, do you want to add anything? Because we need to make that clear. Because I can't tell if Brandon's looking at me and trying to give me the look of, I need to say something now, Gerard. If we were standing in the same room, he would give me a look and I would know immediately that he wanted to chime in and I would be able to say, and now Brandon wants to add something here. But instead, we have to go to something that's more artificial. There's also the potential for conflicting accommodations. So for example, something that I saw that came up in the Q&A chat, someone had requested that the voicing interpreters have their video on so that people who are trying to speech read them can, can see the mouth moving as people are producing language. Um, we've got sometimes potential conflicts. We've got limited resources. We've got limited screen space. We've got limited bandwidth. We've got limited access to this platform, this artifice that's in between all of us. And we have to try to negotiate and navigate how to use that. People relying on sign language interpretation are trying to maximize their screen space so that the sign language can be of sufficient size that it's understandable. Uh, the hearing people need to have a, an auditory experience and blind people are going to need to have extra auditory cues. And sometimes those things may come into conflict with one another. Then, of course, we also have lack of experience and or training. So if this is your first Zoom meeting, it may be very difficult for you to navigate the platform. This is my 100 millionth Zoom meeting approximately. So I, I have a lot of facility with this, this meeting platform, but that means things that are easy for me and things that seem simple for me are not necessarily simple for other people. And I don't necessarily have insight into what you may or may not know uh, is the technical problem that you're having because you don't know how to use the platform in the way that you're attempting to use it. Is there some way that I could help? A lot of uncertainty is introduced here. There's also a small chart on this screen. Um, it's four quadrants. Uh, and on the, the vertical axis, it says controls. And that goes from low to high. And on the horizontal axis, it's demands, which also go from low to high. And uh, this is called a demand control schema. It's very commonly used in interpreter training. So forgive me, Brandon has put up with a lot of my interpreter talk over our time putting our presentations together. Um, but it also is something for job satisfaction. And I think it applies to everyone in these virtual environments. If you were in a situation where you've got high demand, but you have high controls, you've got job satisfaction, you feel comfortable. 
So if you're in a really high pressure meeting, but you're there in person, you know what to expect, you've got access to your colleagues, you've got access to the information, you've got access to the, your accommodations, you're comfortable, you're going to be okay. But take that same high pressure meeting and put it in a virtual environment. And I have now removed a bunch of the controls that you're accustomed to. I'm accustomed to getting visual feedback from everybody in the room. I'm accustomed to having a, so to speak, perfect audio environment where I'm literally sitting right there. I'm accustomed to having a visual picture that's not based on my bandwidth or someone else's bandwidth. So as we take away those controls, but we increase those demands, we're increasing the stress and the pressure that people are under, which makes it more challenging for us to try to accommodate them uh, in virtual spaces. Brandon, did you want to add anything? I actually do. Um, I want to add that not every accessibility feature comes down to equity for different types of disabilities. Um, I want to talk about income inequality and not everybody has the bandwidth or technology due to unemployment or perhaps rural locations. So just a friendly reminder for us to keep those in mind when considering accessible features. It's a win-win for everybody when a product has something that allows a broad group of people to dial in through their landlines uh, because they may or may not have sufficient broadband internet um, or, or whatnot. So I just wanted to throw that in there. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. And this okay. is Gerard. Thank so we you. have our, our next slide, uh, virtual meetings opportunities. Uh, and number one, uh, this is the flip side of that coin that we don't have control over what everyone's user experience is, but presumably that means that each individual has that opportunity to customize their experience to fit their needs. So I have a very specific setup here in my home office, uh, which works well for me and I know how to manipulate all of these things in such a way that it works for me individually. That same setup may not work for Brandon, but the good news is we don't have to share. So I can make my setup work for me and presumably each individual has that opportunity as well. Secondly, we've got user control of the assistive technology. So whatever assistive technology is going to work for you that works for you in your daily life, presumably you should be able to deploy that and use that in your virtual environment, whatever way you interface with your computer. As Brandon said, if you would rather call in over a landline phone or use a 10 digit number to connect into a meeting, then you can do that. So individuals are going to be able to choose the methods that work for them. Third, we've got an expanded pool of participants. So we are no longer limited by geography. Um, we are no longer necessarily limited by disability. People who may not have had physical access in order to actually come to a building or the amount of time that it would take to do that travel is not worth it to them. Uh, it takes less time in some ways because no one has to worry about commuting down from the NAD offices in Silver Spring, poor Howard, I'm picking on Howard too much. Um, everybody can simply connect and join from where they are. So you've got expanded access here. And then productivity, we probably all heard some reports over this over the course of the pandemic and this continued virtual environment where you can attend a meeting and you're still sitting at your computer. So to the extent that they go to a, a, a part of this meeting that isn't of interest to you or not relevant to you, how many of our 500 participants right now are also checking their email or also working on a, a Microsoft Word document that they may need to complete today. And that's totally within your purview. We also now in these remote virtual meetings are having richer remote interactions than we used to with simply conference calls, which were simply audio based, right? Adding the video component, adding shared content, adding some of these meeting moderation tools like hand raising and chat and so forth, those things do make the interaction richer. It makes it more complicated in terms of the platform and that relates to some of the challenges. But ultimately, we have something richer than just an old plain old telephone system where we all call in and hear each other. And the last bullet here is an ellipsis and a question mark because 
we're continuing to find out the opportunities here. Unfortunately, Brandon and I were able to come up with a ton of challenges because this is the space where we work and we're constantly pushing and coming up against the edges of what these things can do. But we are also always on the lookout for the advantages that these things are going to bring. And we don't know. Um, we're just going to have to continue to look out as all of this stuff evolves. Brandon, did you want to add something? No, I'm good, thank you. Let's see here. So universal design is what we're gonna talk about with this particular slide. Uh, this is good meeting practices that help uh, meetings become more inclusive as well as more productive for all the participants, not just individuals with disabilities. Establishing a single point of contact for meeting logistics and accommodation requests is oftentimes incredibly helpful. Obtaining technical support when needed. Obtain, uh, providing the option for a technical test prior to your dry run. So having a dry run is oftentimes incredibly helpful to make sure that everything is up and working before the meeting actually starts. Uh, developing and distributing communication rules prior to the meeting and reviewing them at the start of every meeting. That is very helpful so that everybody's on the same page as far as how the communication needs to effectively uh, happen during that meeting. Um, muting microphones, if you're not talking, for example, turning off your video so that the screen can be maximized. Um, only one person talking at a time. It's not 3D audio um, that we're talking about, so it's not the same as being in a room. And if two people are talking at the same time, the audio broadcast stuff, and it becomes very inaudible, and it's very difficult to, for interpreters to sort out what's being said. Gerard, did you want to add anything? Okay, great. Thank you. If we could go to the next slide, please. So if we're talking about meaning management techniques, um, so I wanted to hold on to that for just a second. Here's a list of some helpful ones that we've found. Having an agenda and having it distributed ahead of time to your meeting, having an agenda, uh, having an attendee list so that we know who's there, as well as a moderator. One participant gets to serve as a meeting moderator. Uh, naming announcements, so reminding participants to identify themselves before they speak. Name announcements is really important so that CART and interpreters know who it is that's talking. Manage turn taking. So if you can establish a clear procedure or utilize a digital tool such as the hand raise feature, that's gonna be helpful in turn taking. And then the last one is document sharing. Making sure that you are distributing any relevant documents for the meeting making sure that those documents are accessible, making sure that they're reviewed and confirmed for accessibility prior to distribution is also helpful. Perhaps there's an individual with a disability who is going to be needing to read that um, and needing it to be accessible. And there's one more slide, I believe, which is the next one. Yeah, this is Gerard. Uh, so I wanted to add, there's no need to go back in the screen uh, share. When we're talking about document sharing, material sharing, it's very important for all participants. Uh, want to make sure that those things are shared in accessible ways, that documents are available in a multitude of formats as a user might need. Also want to make sure that those documents are getting to your service providers. So to the extent that you have sign language interpreters or CART writers that are working on your meeting, try to include them as participants to the meeting in terms of distributing materials so that they can be prepared. Um, Brandon and I were working to try to make sure we got our sign language interpreters a copy of this presentation so that they wouldn't have to work as hard when we're rapid fire going through these slides because hopefully they've seen it before. Uh, so apologies to our interpreters for how quickly we go through all of this stuff. Um, now to continue with our meeting management techniques. Uh, communication styles. So these are again things that you can do when you're 
operating your meetings to try to make sure everyone's on the same playing field, describing content of graphics, trying to speak at a moderate rate as possible, and following your agenda and or staying on topic so that people who are relying on visual information or, uh, or documents to help ground them in the meeting can stay engaged and know where they are. Also want to do a check-in, uh, something I strongly recommend at the top of a meeting, to just check in and see, does everyone have what they need in order to access the meeting? Uh, that gives us people an opportunity to say, hey, you know what, Gerard, you're moving your mic around. It's, it's super annoying. It's very loud. Can you please stop doing it? Oh, great. I, I'd be happy to do that, right? If, if anyone is having an audio issue, a video issue, or an accommodations or an access issue, that's an open forum for them to provide that without having to feel later like they are interrupting the flow of the meeting. You also want to solicit feedback. So not all problems can be anticipated, and there may be things that no one anticipated that come up during the course of the meeting, and people may not want to take the meeting off topic to, to barge in and say, hey, uh, this is annoying the way you're doing the screen sharing. Uh, they may want to provide feedback after the fact and say, you know what, I was able to muddle through. It would be better next time if we could X, Y, or Z. So providing a point of contact for that so that you can continue to iterate and get better at hosting virtual meetings is a great practice. Screen share. Uh, screen share sparingly is generally our guidance here. I realize that we say that there were hypocrites because we are doing a screen share here for the entirety of our presentation. So please forgive us for that. Um, Screen share, generally speaking, and as of the time of this writing, uh, to my and Brandon's knowledge, is generally not accessible to people who are using screen readers. There are some limited exceptions to that that I'm aware of, but there's a general rule screen shared content is not coming across in a way that a conventional screen reader is going to be able to make it accessible to a person who's blind. So... One, don't presume that people are going to have access to that in the same way that Brandon and I are trying to read out all of the content that's on the screen here to make sure that people who are just connected by phone, people who are blind or using a screen reader, those people would be on the same playing field and aren't missing out on any information. So use it with caution. If you absolutely don't need it, consider toggling it on and off. But again, you got to check with your meeting participants. Is toggling it on and off going to be more disruptive because that's going to change the configuration of the video? It's going to change the configuration of the meeting. It's going to be more disruptive. It's something that you're going to have to figure out uh, with your meeting attendees, your participants. And again, try to continue to solicit feedback about that. Brandon, did you want to add anything? Nope, I'm good, thank you. Great. Gerard, this is your slide. Yeah, so next we're going to some equipment and tech recommendations. Uh, try to fine tune your audio. You can see I'm using this incredibly fashionable headset. It looks like I'm about to take off in an airplane. Uh, the reason that I'm doing that is so that I've got high quality audio. I'm a working interpreter, so I always want to have the best quality audio that I can and the closest to my ear that I can. And I'm trying to have a, a good connection to my microphone. So hopefully we've achieved that. And I hope that Marion would have let me know if, if I did not. Um, the thing that you want to do is also try to, if you can, separate your microphone, your input and your output. One of the things that any of these virtual meeting platforms are going to do is act like a speakerphone. And for those of you who don't know, a speakerphone and your computer when it's doing audio is going to try to intelligently cancel out any feedback, right? We know that if you put the microphone close to the speaker that's playing the input from the microphone, you're gonna get that terrible feedback. So your computer knows when you are speaking or making any kind of noise, and it is going to then turn off your incoming audio or lower your incoming audio to avoid creating that. Well, unfortunately, what that does, it means that you can't have that kind of live dynamic conversation where we could, if we were in person, for people who are hearing in particular, uh, you can speak and hear at the same time. We could presumably be talking at the same time, maybe just for a second. Maybe it's just right when you're finishing your comment and say, you know what I wanted to say? And, and that's a cue that I'm interested in taking the turn. Um, but in this case, I might not be heard at all. Um, or I might not be able to hear that uh, my colleague is continuing to speak and now I'm being rude by speaking over them. Uh, so if you can 
even if you're not able to use a fashionable headset like myself, uh, consider using some headphones and you can use the built-in microphone in your computer. But if you're putting your audio through your headphones, your computer knows, oh, I don't have to do all that work of doing the echo cancellation. You also wanna only use one audio connection method. So some of these platforms allow for you to connect via phone or to connect through your computer. Uh, generally pick one, because as I described, uh, the computer when it's working inside itself can do that echo cancellation, but the phone and the computer, they do not talk to each other. So if you have your phone on and you have your computer on, you could be the source of the echo or the source of the feedback. So you can always test out trying to mute yourself to, to minimize that, to see if that makes it go away, to try to figure out if you're the problem. Also wanna to try to fine tune your video if you can. Try to frame your shot. Right now I've got about from my belly button to the top of my head, that's usually what I recommend for people, but I'm a sign language interpreter, so I'm biased, right? So I'm communicating in sign language. So I want to have the top part of my body visible here, but people are sometimes relying on your facial expression or reading your lips. Uh, you may wanna consider getting an external webcam. A lot of computers have built-in webcams, but then you're, you're captive to the angle your screen is at. So you've got the classic laptop angle uh, that's super high. And I'm gonna try to approximate it here by just turning my webcam up. So if I was sitting in a laptop, then I would potentially get this angle because that's the angle that's comfortable for me to look at the screen. Um, but I have an external webcam here that I'm controlling with this uh, handy remote to try to get the right angle for my webcam that's going to keep me comfortable sitting here. I've also disabled autofocus on my camera. So if I left it on, then as I move closer and back, uh, as the lighting and the color changes, it's going to get blurry. It's going to get unblurry. It's going to blurry. It's going to get unblurry. It's sort of distracting, particularly for people who are trying to communicate in sign language or to speech read. And you want to consider turning off your video if it's not needed. For this meeting, my video is on. Brandon's video is on. Uh, we have our sign language interpreters video on, but everyone else is currently video off because uh, we have limited resources. So ideally we would love to see everyone, but we have limited resources. So we're trying to do our best with limited resources. Brandon and I have both talked about providing multiple connection options. So keep flexible by allowing different ways for your participants to attend. So for today's meeting, I know you're able to uh, connect to this meeting natively in the Zoom platform. I also believe, at least according to what's on the top of my screen, that this is being live streamed as well, which is another connection method. And Zoom can be connected to through a phone line. So you've got three different connection methods that give people flexibility. If one isn't working for them, they have some backup options. And that's always a good practice as well. Brandon? Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. I appreciate that. This next slide here is going to show what captioning looks like. So there's automated captioning. Automated speech recognition is what ACR, that acronym means. And then there's the captioning here. And so there's two different uh, results that end up showing up here. And so when someone reads out Edgar Allan Poe's poem here, The Raven, you can see the captioning difference between the two with Microsoft uh, speech recognition. And then you've got Google Meetup, which is using Google Cloud speech text, uh, artificial intelligence AI. So with the Google Meetup AI is, um, you know, there's one word or maybe two words that in here that are not captured correctly. But the point is, is that um, ASR is not the be all end all and should not be depended on because it's just easier and free. Um, CART is something that, you know, I mean, if you've got a last minute meeting and there's no CART that's available, then clearly this is an option. But please do not depend on this as a regular accommodation that's being used or allowing the automated uh, speech recognition to be captioning your videos on YouTube. There are a substantial amount of errors that can happen as a result of the dependency on um, ASR. And you can, see the out, you can see what we have outlined here as an example to kind of like 
make it a little bit more clear about why we want to use a human um, who is doing the CART services for us. If we could go on to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about Zoom. Gerard really does know a lot much more about uh, Zoom. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Gerard to talk about this particular slide. Thanks, Brandon. This is Gerard. So we're talking about Zoom, the platform that we're on right now. Now, mind you, we are in Zoom webinar right now, which has a slightly different feature set. So again, this is that licensing uh, problem that we talked about before, where there are some different feature sets available for different products, even under the same brand. Uh, we have two columns on the screen here. We've got some pros and we've got some cons. Uh, pros, Zoom is generally well known to be highly accessible via screen reader. Uh, some large organizations for the blind use Zoom as their primary method of communication, knowing that uh, the simple intuitive user interface is much easier to navigate when you're trying to access it through a screen reader, which I've tried to explain to people before, using a computer through a screen reader is sort of like looking at it through a straw where you're able to see one individual element at a time. And the relationships between those things are not always entirely clear and what their functions are. So a lot of that uh, is a lot easier when you have a pared down interface. It also has side-by-side -side mode and dual monitor support. Uh, so I believe Lance was talking about side-by-side -side mode earlier today, where you've got one window for someone who's a one screen user. And basically you've got a line down the middle where you see either the speaker view or the gallery view, according to your preference, again, in Zoom meeting. Uh, and then you can see screen shared content on the other panel. And the user on the end user side can then adjust the relative size of those two things. So for people who are more interested in seeing the video, who are relying on ASL interpretation or what have you, uh, they could shift that one way. For people who may be relying on uh, either audio or a combination of looking at the content, audio and captioning, can slide the video a little bit smaller, you make that work for you. That's very effective. It also has a dual monitor mode. So I right now have two monitors in front of me. So on one monitor, I see all of the videos from Zoom. And on the other monitor, I'm seeing the screen share full size. So that's a nice feature for those who can uh, use a two monitor setup. It can also generally has a high quality video and audio connection with a really low stutter rate. We've got, generally speaking, uh, a nice solid connection here over Zoom uh, without a lot of interruptions. It also has the option to hide non-video participants, which sounds like it would be something that's intuitive. It's not always the case on every platform. Um, so being able to just limit the boxes that are displayed in your gallery view to those that are active videos is very helpful. There's also built-in support for captioning here, which is important. Those of you who are on Zoom right now know that we are using captioning. Um, however, uh, at least as of this writing, when we were updating this, Zoom did not have built-in support for any automated speech recognition captioning. Brandon was talking about ASR just now, so I don't need to go into it that much detail. But right now, you must have an outside vendor who is providing the captioning. Now, whatever method they're using on their end, uh, but that captioning can be fed into the pl platform, which is definitely a pro so that you can get captioning natively built in. You can support up to 100 video participants uh, or 350 participants total. Again, this is on your Zoom meeting, not your Zoom webinar. And you've got now multi-pinning and multi-spotlight support. Uh, and what that means is pinning is something that's individual to the user. So I can make pins, Brandon can make pins. Those pins are the videos that we decide are important to us and don't affect other users. When I pin Brandon's video so that he's full screen for me, it doesn't affect other users view. Um, spotlight is the opposite. Spotlight is where you can decide what everyone will see, which I believe largely is what we're using in the Zoom webinar right now. Uh, and at this point, they have implemented multi-pin and multi-spotlight. Previously, I could only pick one person to see, but now I could pick Brandon. Uh, I could also pick Howard. Those would be my two go-tos, right? Because I want to see the people who are signing. Um, and multi-spotlight. So I could spotlight our uh, sign language interpreter, myself, and Brandon, so that we could ensure that that's what everyone is seeing. Those people would have that option again in Zoom meeting, not necessarily in Zoom webinar. 
but they'd retain the option to go back to their preferred view. They can switch back and forth between gallery and speaker view. There are certainly some cons to Zoom as well. The integrated meeting management tools lack some sophistication. We were talking about ways to manage your meeting, uh, hand raising, uh, document sharing, communication. Those things are present in Zoom. They're a little more rough around the edges. So the hand raising tool, not always super helpful. Um, some of those things are not quite there. So we're trying to work around them or augment them. The captioning display, um, as I think some people have indicated, is sometimes a little unpredictable. Um, it sometimes lacks some sophistication in terms of the amount to which you can customize the size, the color, the background, the contrast, et cetera. Um, that's unfortunate. There are certainly some security concerns. That's no news to anybody. It made big news earlier this year, even though they're continuing to work on those things. But there is some concern about that, particularly amongst government agencies or other large agencies. Uh, and then, Brandon, did you want to talk about the built-in live ASR? Thank you. I do. Yes. So recently, a new development is otter.ai has partnered with Zoom to provide the automatic, automated captioning. You need to have a paid license in order to use that, either a pro license or a business license in order to take advantage of that capability. It's one of the drawbacks. Um, it's not available to anybody who's gotten a free account. And so that's a little unfortunate because that limits accessibility. Um, in the next slide, we're gonna talk about captioning. Um, I just wanna check in with Gerard first. Yeah, oh. the, the next slide is just a screenshot of a Zoom meeting. Now we're all sitting here in a Zoom meeting, so it may seem a little extraneous, um, but we've just seen a gallery view for Zoom meeting here. This is one of my staff meetings, um, and I am the person in the Spider-Man outfit because it was a uh, favorite sports team day, and my favorite sports team is Spider-Man, uh, of course, so wear your favorite sports uniform. Um, so you can just see you've got the gallery view, and you can toggle back and forth between speaker view, and we've got a nice clean user interface here. Um, we can go to the next slide, which I believe shows uh, our side-by-side -side mode. So this is a generic screenshot of the side-by-side -side mode. Again, not going to be news to anybody who's on this call right now, um, but you've got that little bar in the center there that allows you to drag and adjust the, the uh, relative size of the gallery view or the speaker view, because you can still toggle those back and forth and the shared content. And if we can go to the next slide, uh, Brandon can talk to us a little bit about uh, captioning in Zoom. Thank you. When I talk about captioning, it's a relatively new feature, I think maybe just in the last quarter. Um, at the bottom, it had the caption bar, but now it, you can move it anywhere. Um, on the screen that fits for you. So that's something that you can maybe try yourself if you've got the captioning turned on. You can move it near the speaker's mouth so that you, if you are using uh, lip reading as a technique of uh, capturing the information, then that's something that you can have side by side next to the person's um, face. You can move it up into the right corner, you can move it in the left corner um, or at the bottom. So if you go to the next slide, please. Brandon, just just really quickly on that. So that's a new feature to me. I was not aware of that feature until Brandon told me about it just now. So thank you, Brandon. But I also don't know whether that's something that's implemented on mobile platforms. So we were talking about all of the vagaries of the diverse ways that people interact here. And I'm not certain whether that's a function that would work on your iPad or on your iPhone or on your Android device. That's something that I would have to look into. We would have to test or find documentation about that in order to see how it's going to work. That is, um, that is a good question indeed. To my best knowledge, the captioning works on Android or iPhone mobile platforms, but the moving it from top to bottom or left to right um, may not necessarily be available on the mobile platforms. So in this next slide here, the, one of the new features, you can see a roll-up with the captioning before it looked like uh, a pop-out captioning, which means it would um, come in and out. And that was a drawback 
um, because if there was something that was captioned and it was it was the window was popping in and up. It wasn't giving people enough time to read through it before it disappeared. And so now Zoom has changed that um, so that it rolls up. So it's a very nice feature, but it also allows you to catch up um, and you can uh, widen the screen so that it's on one particular side so that you've got a larger uh, screen for reading those. And that makes things a lot easier. I also wanted to mention one more thing regarding this. The stream text. This is still the best solution. And it is because it's um, deaf friendly, but also deaf blind friendly. So people who have a braille reader that uh, does the captioning as it goes along, Zoom doesn't have that capability uh, or any other platform that I'm aware of. And so having the stream text is another way of providing accessibility to both Zoom and uh, with, the, with streaming text at the same time. And that's really um, an, a, a very uh, advantageous uh, accommodation for deaf blind folks that are participating in meetings. Gerard, did I miss anything? Do you want to add anything? All right. So we could go on to the next slide. And I believe the next slide is yours, Gerard. Yeah, this is Gerard. So we'll talk briefly about Cisco WebEx, uh, another very common, uh, commonly used platform. Uh, we've got pros and cons again for Cisco WebEx. Pros, easy to procure. WebEx has been around for a long time. People are very familiar with Cisco. It's very well set up uh, and security and enterprise ready. They have checked every box to be ready to be deployed at your agency in your business. They're ready to go. Uh, and because they're a known entity, sometimes your IT apparatus is a little bit more willing to move forward with those types of things more quickly. Uh, you do have the capability on WebEx to create a separate module for captioning, and that's called the multimedia viewer. Uh, so that's like a, a pod that exists inside the interface. So that's nice that you have that as standalone feature that exists there. And then you've got centralized feature management. So for any given meeting, you can work with whoever your administrator is or the owner of your account to enable or disable certain features for your upcoming meeting. Now that is something that also exists in a lot of these platforms. Zoom has the ability to turn features on and off, but uh, at Cisco WebEx for the enterprise level, there's a lot more administrative there that where they can eliminate those uh, types of features that may be problematic or they're worried about security. The cons for Cisco WebEx, it's not really so usable for screen reader users. Please know also that I'm making a distinction here between usable and accessible. So I do not mean to imply that any of these programs are not accessible. Uh, there is every possibility that every one of these programs that we've talked about today is technically accessible to a screen reader. That is, it outputs information to a screen reader that can be read to a person who is blind or deafblind using a refreshable braille display. However, there is a real difference between something being accessible and something being usable. Um, so my go-to example for this, and I apologize, Brandon, for this tangent, um, but it's very common for people now to use a uh, sort of random number generator as a token for two-factor authentication. So that is something that is counting down, sometimes on your smartphone, it's got to count down until that code is going to change. So technically, that entire thing may be screen reader uh, accessible. It may read me that number, and I can prompt and go through the number. But what does that program do when I've run out of time and I'm in the middle of that number? If I'm a blind user, does it tell me that the numbers changed? Does it automatically put me back to the first number so that I can start all over again? Does it give me enough time to even be able to use that, to be able to hear each number individually to put them in before my time is going to elapse. That's really the difference between accessibility and usability. Um, so not certain that Cisco WebEx is very usable. My experience of working with people who are blind has been very challenging for them to navigate that interface. 
even for people who are sighted and who aren't using a screen reader, I've used it myself. I found it sort of cumbersome in terms of just managing it um, and using the interface requires some training and some familiarity, whereas other platforms are a little more intuitive. The video pinning functionality, at least in my last using, was not as intuitive as well. It kind of used a different logic where I'm I'm pinning a position to a person as opposed to pinning a video in place. It, it sometimes a little unintuitive and the video interface is less flexible and doesn't give you uh, all of the various options that you have in some of these platforms that are more built around video. Uh, one of the cons here is we've got centralized feature management. Again, my experience with this has been that if I want to have any given feature on, I have to make sure I have that laundry list ready for my account administrator so they can turn all those things on. Makes it very difficult for me to pivot in a meeting if I have need of another uh, another feature potentially. Um, and you've got uh, additional steps that are required in order to be able to join the meeting. And I apologize, this text has sort of disappeared into the bottom uh, of our of our PowerPoint here. But when you're trying to join a meeting, it's not simply just like click to join, it's click, go to the website, enter your name, enter your email address, enter any other information the meeting host may have asked for you to put in, and then click and then get prompted to either download a one time or run an exe on your computer. It is not as seamless a process as many of the other uh, uh, platforms are. Brandon, did you want to add anything to that? I do. I do. So I wanted to mention that for captioning on uh, the on the multi pin, when you're sharing screens, you're showing a PowerPoint or maybe a desktop, and then you've got captioning that's going on on the side. So sometimes sharing screens at the same time eats up an incredible amount of bandwidth. So keep that in mind for people who are using their captioning and it's lagging and they can't figure out why it's lagging or they're sharing some feedback with you about the captioning running behind, this th having dual screens and running all of those things at the same time can be incredibly bandwidth um, using. And I think if we, we can go, go to the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. And so again, here we've just got a uh, a screenshot of the gallery view for WebEx where uh, you can see it's just your standard four by four grid, um, but you've also have the meeting tools are overlaying the videos on that bottom of the screen. So just one of those things that indicates a little bit about the sophistication of the video interface here that may not be ideal for all users. You're covering some people's mouths. You could be covering people's hands who are attempting to communicate in sign language uh, or, or so forth. And we can go to the next slide. And the next slide here is a screenshot of the Cisco WebEx Meeting Center. This is where you're going to potentially set up your meeting. And we have the multimedia viewer here, which is sort of an inset pod in the lower right hand corner uh, that is right now white text on a black background uh, showing that captioning. So it does not appear in at least in this screenshot like it does uh, in Zoom and some other platforms where it appears much more like closed captioning you may be accustomed to on television. And we can go to the next slide unless Brandon, did you want to add anything to that? No, not this particular slide, no, thank you. So with Google uh, Meet, there are some pros that are listed here. It is FedRAMP approved for some agencies, like GSA, they've got it approved. Um, it's pretty easy to use, it's very intuitive. It also uses a uh, Google speech to text uh, AI as far as the captioning mechanism. And there is a high percentage of accuracy using that. And it tells you which person is speaking because it's separate uh, as far as the audio channels go. So Google knows who is speaking uh, when, which is very helpful. It has a grid layout for videos. If there is more than eight or nine people present, 
I think that it had an update during the summertime, which was nice, that allows uh, for more grids per screen. Um, it is screen reader and keyboard accessible. It is audio. Uh, it, you can connect up via a phone connection. However, when you're sharing a PowerPoint through the, through the screen share, the screen reader may not be able to read that, what you're sharing on the screen. So Google Meet is not available uh, government-wide, so that's a drawback. Um, and there's a limited number of video participants um, that depending on your license, it could be anywhere from 100 to 250, but that's also um, one of the drawbacks. Um, you could get, you know, an organizational license or uh, a business license or a pro license, and that could provide some more flexibility. Next slide, please. You can see what this looks like on this particular slide. On the bottom, you can see that there's two separate captions that are there, and they're separated by their picture and their name, and that, so that's really nice so that you know who's talking. And it also works on a mobile platform, and it tells you who's speaking. I remember that on my mobile device, it didn't have uh, the grid layout. It was just the active speaker. So that's potentially a drawback if you're curious about who's actually in the meeting. We could go to the next slide. So this is Adobe Connect. Uh, there are a lot of government agencies that heavily rely on uh, Adobe Connect as a platform. Uh, it's easy to purchase uh, the security and uh, it's enterprise ready. So there is a grid layout for video feed, which makes it nice that you're able to have people's cameras on and see people's faces in the meetings. It's got um, a UI that's incredibly flexible and can add a dedicated pod for captioning and it can be moved. You can uh, have a variety of different setups for the screen. You can put captioning at the bottom, you can put captioning at the top. It's um, HTML5 friendly as well as a desktop application available. You can install that on your, on your desktop if that's what you would like to do. I also have some good news to share with you. Adobe is now working with a brand new podless captioning system that uh, should be available soon in the next couple of months with Adobe Connect. Um, I'm hoping before summer. So that's going to be incredibly nice, which means that if you were the host, you don't have to, you know, upload a pod for the captioning support and all of the stuff that goes along with getting that involved in the meeting. It's going to be, um, the vendor is going to be able to provide that. And so uh, we are not going to have to be looking for downloading files and uploading them to Adobe Connect. And there's, it's, kind of, it's a lot to get that set up for a meeting. So this is gonna be a much more seamless approach um, for Adobe Connect. Um, some of the cons that we've got here are bandwidth intensive and it absolutely deprioritizes video. Um, there's a lot of uh, freezing that can happen. Um, it's a complex user interface. It is not usable uh, for screen readers and it's not friendly as far as that goes, um, especially when you're sharing a screen. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have the capability of uh, reading screens at all. Video pinning is not available as far as the function goes. And if you want add-ons for functionality purposes like call-in numbers and whatnot, you have to pay additional for licenses for that, those specific uh, separate functionalities. I also wanted to mention something about the video. So Adobe is actively working on developing new video enhancements as well as um, video, 
codes for this that are going to improve the quality of the videos. At the same time, um, you know, be able to maximize the bandwidth so that we will have clear video while saving bandwidth. So like what we were talking about with Zoom, hopefully we're gonna have something that is Zoom comparative um, because the government does use Adobe Connect so much. Hopefully that's gonna end up happening soon. So this is what an Adobe uh, layout looks like. You've got a chat box here, you've got a share screen in the top corner here. Um, you've got uh, links and you've got notes, you've got attendees, you've got lists. This is, this is a pretty typical layout that you'll see at meetings. Next slide. And then we'll show what the video looks like. So you've got a typical Hollywood Squares here. You'll see, you know, that typical setup that you've got going on. Um, you also have two options. You've got a grid layout, which is a three, three by three, the Hollywood Square standard. Or you've got film strip, which means that whoever is the active speaker is going to become the, the big part of the screen. And then you've got little strips um, at the bottom. Uh, we don't have, a, we don't have a, a picture of what that looks like. Gerard said that it depends on the noise as well. Yeah, this is uh, Gerard. Uh, just just quickly to just say that some of those features that are implemented across platforms, Zoom has this as well, uh, can automatically cycle your featured speaker in speaker view based on audio input. Uh, so seems like a great feature. Doesn't always work well when you've got people who potentially have their audio coming from other sources. Um, for today's meeting, for example, Brandon uh, and I and uh, Athena, who's interpreting for Brandon today, we're trying to figure out uh, a solution here. So Athena has called in to use Brandon's participant ID so that her phone audio is associated with his video. So he would be displaying, but again, that's dependent on having those flexibilities of connection options and not everything has that. Um, so all that to say that sometimes approach that with caution because moving with who's speaking sounds good, but it sometimes doesn't account for people who are relying on uh, other accommodations. Thank you for that comment. Uh, I appreciate that. And we've, we worked hard to get to where we are today. Yes, thank you. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. I'm gonna show you what uh, videoing and captioning looks like. This is uh, again, Adobe Connect. This is um, not the captioning pod. This is another second screen share uh, uh, on my computer that shows the captioning that has been put into this. And that's why I was mentioning um, the bandwidth that is used around that. So keep in mind if you're using um, Adobe Connect that that may be another approach. I really advocate this, this method. We've done a lot of trial and errors, um, you know, with colors and fonts. Um, that's something that can be played with on this forum with the standalone caption pod with Adobe Connect. It's not that easy and it's not uh, as user friendly for people to customize if you need a color contrast, for example. In the next slide, I'm going to talk about Microsoft Teams. So with Microsoft Teams, there are a lot of organizations government-wide that are using Microsoft Teams um, because of COVID and working remotely. So it is easy to procure. Um, it is security and enterprise ready. Uh, it is available to almost all government agencies with Office 365. Um, it has built in Office 365 applications for real time collaboration. If you have Outlook, it, you can click uh, on a meeting invite and call in and everything is right at your fingertips. So you can, you know, uh, pin a person. It's got multi pinning. Uh, but one of the drawbacks 
that I want to talk about in the call in the cons column. Teams is all in one platform and it has got many features that are amazing, but it's also a little bit confusing to use. Trying to figure out where to go and what to do has been a little less than intuitive. Microsoft is currently in trying to figure out some of the processing and they're seeing how it's being used on such a large scale right now and trying to figure out some ways of changing that. It also has some accessibility issues. Guests cannot be pinned. And this is incredibly problematic if you have a freelance interpreter who is not a government uh, employee and they do not have a GFE, a government furnished equipment, a laptop, then they can't be pinned, which is a problem for deaf people who need to have an interpreter pinned to be able to see them clearly. That has been an ongoing running issue. Captioning is also an issue. Um, it's not reliable. They are using automatic captioning as well. And every once in a while, it'll freeze um, and it won't work. And I have to turn it on and turn it back on again. And finally, it'll restart the captioning, uh, you know, in the middle of something. And it's Microsoft is aware of the issue. They are working on it, but it is problematic. Screen readers um, as accessibility. I know that there's some kind of shortcut uh, sheet that explains it, how JAWS can work with Microsoft Teams, and that's nice. Um, but uh, all of the other platforms, when you share PowerPoint or when you are screen sharing, that's not something that's accessible in any way for a screen reader. And so this is a little bit better on that front. Um, Gerard, did you want to add anything to this particular slide with Microsoft Teams? Yeah, this is Gerard. Uh, just a real quick note, something that I, I think should be on the slide. Um, my experience with the content and screen share function in Microsoft Teams has been inconsistent. So uh, it's been a little unintuitive for me, and I've been working with people who have been basically unable to access uh, ASL interpretation while screen share is taking place. Um, I can't always explain that because there have been times that it has worked for me when I've popped the screen share out to another window and I've been able to see the uh, the uh, gallery window separately. And so those things have been separate. But again, I have the advantage of having two monitors. So that type of thing works for me because if I did have two windows, I could put one window on one monitor and one window on another. But if you were trying to work on a laptop and you've got screen share that's popped out to another window, you're stuck either looking at tiny film strip videos or looking at the gallery view or swapping back and forth. So uh, all that to say that it's been a little inconsistent. They're continuing to update that. So as with all these things, it's in flux, but I will just say that it has been a little inconsistent. It's been a little unintuitive uh, and it's been frustrating, particularly for sign language users who are trying to work with sign language interpreters. Thank you, agreed. And those are some good points. Thanks for reminding me. I forgot about that information. So yes, thank you for adding that. And I have to, I have to admit, you know, what George said was it, this isn't exactly intuitive and always, you know, user friendly. Teams automatic captioning uses Azure um, AI, and hmm, there's no way for Cart to feed captioning through Teams. It, it's just not, there's just no access for that. Um, and because it's AI based. And so that is also a drawback that should probably be added onto the screen. Um, I wanted to mention that Microsoft is partnering with uh, the federal government uh, because there are many accessibility issues that they are working currently on remediating. I wish that I could share more information with you about that, but suffice it to say that what I can tell you is that Microsoft is working on it and they are aware of some of the issues that uh, folks with disabilities are facing as far as accessibility goes and they're working on it. So with the licensing, I wanted to talk a little bit about that last point on the, on the con section here. Uh, when COVID started, we all ended up like moving over to Zoom and it was kind of a learn as you go and we were finding things out. Like I found out that there was no way for me to call VRS if I had a meeting, video relay service. 
So I kind of looked into it and found out that my agency had chosen to get the cheapest license available. And that um, does not come with dial-in phone numbers. And so I had to talk to my group and say, hi, if my interpreter is not available, I need to have a mechanism for calling in um, through the relay service. And so we ended up having to upgrade our license that gave us that capability. A drawback is I have to host the meeting though. If anybody else in my team wants to host a meeting, um, if they are making a meeting invitation, it doesn't come with a dial-in number. So because my license was upgraded, I have to do it. So the responsibility falls on my shoulder all the time. And I don't particularly care for that so much. So I've had a conversation with my agency and we've decided that um, everybody is going to be getting the upgraded license, uh, which is nice, which means that everybody can share in the responsibility of hosting meetings with a call-in number. So it's not just for people who have disabilities, but also maybe people who have a computer microphone issues and suddenly they find their computer microphone isn't working. They've got to call in on their phone. Um, that is also something that is beneficial as far as a universal design of this particular license. Um, accessibility and accommodation. Again, we're going to say that both of those things are different. We talked about it at the beginning of the, of the presentation. You know, and now as a result of this particular accommodation, it's become accessible for everybody. And so I'm gonna show you what Teams looks like on the next slide. So Microsoft uh, did come out with, you know, uh, some cooler features. This is the standard Hollywood Square setup. And I believe that there can be up to 30. Oh, there's a seven by seven. So you can have seven on the screen for that. So the, that's a new, it's called a together mode where you can see everybody in the audience. It, it's, it's pretty interesting as far as the look goes. Um, just, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> it's interesting. You can check it out for yourself if you want to take a peek at it. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I'll show you what the captioning looks like. So you can see the captioning, it froze and then disappeared. And then it comes back. And then it will continue and then it disappears. So that has been uh, a little bit of a problem. And yeah, they continue, they're continuing to work on it. Sure. did you want to add anything? Yeah, just uh, first I want to apologize. There may be some background noise on my line because the challenges of working at home. So I hope everyone will, will bear with me. Um, I will also say that on, in the together mode vein, there are a number of these features that are coming out for any of these platforms that are intended to be kind of like fun, fancy features. Everybody's now familiar with virtual backgrounds. I would gather, but I'll explain it briefly. It's where you're basically able to substitute an image. So instead of seeing my, my, my cloth backdrop here, I could substitute a, a photo of Brandon's beautiful background and I could put that behind myself. And that way I would uh, look a little bit more uh, esteemed like Brandon does. Uh, but those types of features are fun. They're, they're cool. There's video filters that you can use. And of course, a lot of different people are using this. Kids are using this stuff for school. So there's some interest in these kind of interesting and fun features. And uh, those things aren't always good for people with disabilities, right? The, the way that the masking works with virtual backgrounds sometimes can affect video quality. It can be very distracting in terms of the visual images being displayed. So all that to say that some of those features are, are fun and cool and you may want to play with them, but I would always encourage you to make sure that you're closely in touch with people with disabilities and everybody in your meeting just say like, hey, we can always go back to, to bare bones. We can always go back to square one. We should always go back to the common denominator that works for everybody, even when we have some of these, these new fancy shiny features. And I think we can go to the next slide. Um, briefly talking about live streaming. Uh, live streaming can be done through a variety of different platforms. Certainly you can live stream over YouTube, you can live stream over Twitter or Facebook or any number of other options. We've simply listed some of these top three here. Uh, and largely when you're streaming, you might be conducting your meeting via Zoom like we are now. 
but taking that content from that Zoom meeting and streaming it to another platform. So the pros that you have for this, uh, you've got less bandwidth. So the person who's trying to just view your meeting only has to watch a single video stream. They're not trying to manage all of these simultaneous streams of information. It's just like watching any video on YouTube or any live streamed video, but it's just one video. They also don't have outgoing information any more than they ordinarily would. It also gives the host more control over what you're going to broadcast, um, where we were talking about some of the vagaries of what does it look like on your end? I'm not sure what it looks like on your device. Well, when you are doing a live stream, you can curate that very particularly what you want it to look like. I want the sign language interpreter to consistently be here, and I want to rotate my speakers through here, and I want the captions to be here, and it's going to look that way for everyone. You can also burn in the captioning, so you've got open captioning as opposed to closed captioning and you've got a lower barrier for access if you've got a phone if you've got an internet connection you can be on you don't have to download anything you shouldn't have to install anything you can pull up the website you can watch the live stream the cons for this a lot of moving parts of course and if you want to get fancy with it at all and you're not just outputting what's in your meeting you want to make sure to curate it a little bit more it requires some media and productive production experience some technical intensive knowledge particularly when you want to keep those things accessible uh burning in and embedding the captions are going to like open captions right where the captions can't be toggled off by the user it's part of the video stream on the one hand we know what the captions are going to look like we know the captions are going to be there on the other hand, those captions are now just video content and a deafblind person or a blind person who's trying to read those captions through a refreshable braille display, those things aren't text anymore. That's an image. So providing a separate uh, feed of just the captioning this is something that we do with the Federal Communications Commission, not to toot our own horn, but our live stream displays in a video player. And beneath that, we have a widget that is just the captioning stream in a text format that allows for that to be screen readable. Streaming services also really reliant on the ASR generated captioning. So sometimes that results in some of those flubs that we're accustomed to seeing some awkward captioning. Uh, so we wanna be wary of that if you're doing the live streaming. And now what we've done is we've taken more control for the host. We know what it's gonna look like, but that means I've taken away the agency from the end users. So their customization is less impactful now. So it's, it's a balancing act, it's an equation. And then we just pushed it back in another direction. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. Did you want me to talk about this one, Brandon, or did you wanna talk about this one? Okay. No, go ahead. Sure. So what we've got here are a couple examples of some different live streamed events. Uh, these largely are some press conferences that we've seen from uh, various government agencies. So on this, we've got uh, sort of a small thin bar through the screen that has your video content. We've got banners at the top, captioning on the bottom. Uh, you've got a square with the governor's video on the left hand side. We've got your standard widescreen PowerPoint in the middle. And then on the right hand side, that bar is cut through the middle and the sign language interpreter video is there and it's half the height of all the rest of the videos uh, and probably a quarter of the width. So it's much, much smaller to make room for a logo that goes over top of that sign language interpreter's video. So not a great example, not really showing the relative importance of these things, not providing meaningful access to the sign language interpretation, uh, generally a little clunky. And we can go to the next slide. So now we've gotten a, a little bit better here. We've got picture in picture in the upper right hand corner of this showing the sign language interpreter. We've got your classic closed captioning over the like bottom third, uh, middle third of your screen. Uh, and we've got the video of our main speaker that's full screen here. And we can go to our next slide if you would. Uh, now we've got another example here. Again, we've got uh, this example, and I apologize, it, it seems like it's buffering a little bit here, but we transitioned here from a picture in picture to a three panel. So we had the, the main speaker was full screen, We've got captioning, we've got a Chiron, but then when they want to go to some dynamic, which would be quote screen shared content, then the screen cuts into thirds on the left hand side of the screen, we've got the speaker and we've got the interpreter. And then on the right hand side of the screen, we have the PowerPoint presentation. If we can go to the next slide.
So in this slide, we're, we're talking about Okay, hi. So sorry. So in this particular slide, this what it is what it looks like when there's open captioning that is embedded in the video. It's so hard to see and it's not really clear um, because of the opacity. It, it's not exactly user friendly uh, for people that have disabilities, uh, perhaps maybe somebody who is deafblind um or that rely on closed captioning or um a, an embossing machine this is this is like not the way to go um open captions should be available everywhere regardless of what platform it is that's using it it, it really shouldn't matter they should just be available period um, we should not have to be worried about turning them on and or off but that's you know, has been uh, that's been a battle that's been fought for a long time, and hasn't really seen much change. If we could go on to the next slide, there we go. In this particular slide, I want to talk about uh, virtual event platforms. This is new. I mean, as as a result of COVID, we're seeing more events that are happening that need platforms to be used, and so. I've been interviewing a lot of vendors over the past couple of months, um, and it is clear that there are some of them who have not included accessibility in the front end of their design work. And when they're asked about it, they're like, oh, hmm. Well, we didn't really think about that. And so what ends up happening is time and money is having to be invested at the back end of a project when they are um, having to go back and remediate stuff that should have been taken care of in the beginning. So some of the pros that are here is they, they, there is less bandwidth that's required. There is more control of broadcasting different, com different pieces and parts, so the content and the video feeds to the audience, especially with picture-in-picture -picture ASL interpreters and burn-on captioning. It is uh, ease of access. Everybody who has a computer and a mobile device can use it. Um, some ventures have incorporated um, accessibility features into their platform or design, which has been great. There's uh, other vendors who, again, have not, and you know those are ones that aren't that we won't be using. Some of the cons here are the cost can be astronomical. I, I'm not actually kidding you guys. I have been shocked. So my agency wanted to host a one day virtual um, accessibility day. And, you know, we were getting prices of 30 to $50,000 for a one day event. Um, and that was, you know, not in alignment with our budget. And so, you know, trying to host something, if you're doing that, be prepared for the cost that could be involved. Um, there are many moving parts. Uh, with a lot of technology intensive knowledge um, as far as implementing solutions, specifically with regard to accessibility. And so you need to be prepared for that. Um, and to be able to sit down with the vendors who may not, again, have considered that and including that in part of their process to be able to talk to about what you need. Um, burned in or embedded captions on streams are not accessible for screen readers or refreshable braille display users. So that's something else to keep in mind. And it does not allow for a great uh, degree of customization. Um, if you need to pin a sign language interpreter, um, the host can, but users are not able to take what it is that they need and make it a work for them. So let me show you uh, an example. If we could have the next slide, please. So on this, you will see that there, Microsoft hosted a big event and I think it was called Disability, uh, it was a disability event that they had. And so you'll see there's a question and answer period or question and answer pod on the right hand side. And then there's four different panelists that have got their video on with their names. And then on the bottom, you've got an interpreter and then you've got burn in captioning next to that underneath some of the speakers. Um, and again, that Q&A pod on the right hand side. If you could go to the next slide, please.
So if somebody decided to shower, share a PowerPoint screen, so then you would end up with it looking like this. Um, and the interpreter and the, um, the captioning ends up being the same versus all the other stuff. But this was $30,000 for one day, for one day. So that was uh, definitely a drawback with this particular um, platform. I wanted to mention that we had worked with one vendor and what was interesting was the vendor had some good strategies for improving their particular platform. They uh, created a solution where they could turn on and off for the picture in picture so that participants could turn it on and off. And uh, another cool thing that they had was you could rearrange your screen however you wanted. If you wanted to put somebody next to a speaker, you could, you could realign the windows. Um, it was kind of a little bit like Zoom captioning where you could move that hey, Christina, to the I'm captioning still area. With the export right now, but I'm reading Monica's email. <laughs> And I'm becoming much more disturbed is the term that I'm using. Like, so, so at this point, all our programs. Everyone, we're sorry. I, Give us one second as we try yeah, to mute that line. I think we're good. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, the point being that the vendor had ASR captioning, but they didn't have a way to feed it uh, via cart. And so that's something that they are working on remediating as a result of our conversation. The next slide um, is gonna be our wrap up. And so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, show you guys that and turn that over. But Gerard, I believe that this is your slide. Yes, thank you, Brandon. Howard's getting the hook out for us here. So luckily we are right right at the end. So how do we pick a platform? How do you pick a platform with all this information? None of them are perfect. Sorry. You know, we don't really have a perfect answer for you. Everything has its limitations. So check with your agency, your organization, see what you already have access to. Uh, once you know that, engage people with disabilities, your stakeholders to test, play with them, evaluate them, try to break them, try to find out how they're not going to work for you. And then when you identify those weaknesses, you can implement your behavioral changes, your meeting management techniques to try to accommodate for that, to try to minimize, mitigate the, the damage that those things are going to do to the accessibility of your meetings. And you can augment your service with other services uh, like separate captioning that we discussed about having a standalone or pop out captioning or using a separate standalone hand raising tool or what have you. So it's an iterative process. And I think we can go to the next slide and then we're going to jump right to questions here. Another important thing, ask how can I help, right? Always be willing to think what can we do differently? Be willing to iterate. Don't let a perfect setup be the enemy of having a good setup, but also don't stop collecting feedback. Don't stop looking for a better answer. Um, but you don't need to necessarily abandon what you're doing because there is no perfect solution out there right now. Stay flexible and spend some time to save your time. Spend some time planning your meetings. Spend some time on those meeting management techniques. Spend some time on turn taking. It's going to save you time in the long run. Your meetings will be more productive. Uh, we also have our contact information that's listed on the screen here. I'm Gerard Williams, gerard.williams at fcc.gov and Brandon Pace, Brandon dot pace at hq.dhs.gov. Uh, and we also have a link to the archived presentation full length that we did last time. I know Howard is thinking, how could there be more full length than this? So uh, Brandon, unless you have anything else, I think I'll try to get it to Howard so we can take some questions. Okay, at this juncture, I'll turn it to the access board members to see if they have any questions. 
and then Brandon and Gerard can respond to those. So Rosemary, if you wanted to take over navigating for board member questions. Uh, yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, again, this is Rosemary uh, with the U.S. Access Board staff. And uh, if there are um, public members or members of the board that have any questions, please raise your hand. That would be Alt-Y on the keyboard. And I'm getting a note to put the interpreter on the screen. Edson. All right. Going once, public members, uh, board members, any questions, please raise your hand. That would be Alt Y on the keyboard. This is Howard. I just want to make sure first everyone can see me. Yes, we can. I am not seeing hands. And I am still not seeing any hands. I uh, understand that people can now see me. Terrific. So I see several questions emanating from the Q&A for it. So perhaps Gerard and Brandon, if there are any of those you feel you can answer, I don't, I'm hesitant to select any in particular, but if you wanted to answer a couple of those and in lieu of that, also asking our board members if they have particular questions for you. And this is Rosemary again. I do have, I do see Patrick Cannon with his hand raised. Patrick, you can unmute your, your line. This is Howard, if we could have the interpreter on screen, please. Okay, Patrick, if you have a question, um, please unmute your line. Okay, um, I turn it back to you, Howard. Okay, terrific. So there was a couple of things that I would like to point out first. Just one moment. So I think Brandon and Gerard just gave a very comprehensive presentation raising myriad issues related to accessibility of online platforms. I think it's very important information where access is concerned because when we meet in the physical environment, it's a quite a different uh, setting than it is as we found in the virtual environment in which we currently live. For uh, a, a variety of deaf organizations and universities got together to create a matrix on the pros and cons of various online video conferencing platforms. They looked at the features that they all had and that matrix, oh, I'm trying to pull it up so I can share the website with you.
So the link for that matrix shows the features that those varying video conferencing platforms have. And it was done by several deaf led organizations in consultation with some universities. I also want to mention that many of the platforms that were just discussed by our presenters each have different uh, priorities and weightings in terms of the video feed versus the audio feed. Some prioritize video when there's sufficient bandwidth, some prioritize audio and re therefore reduce the video. What that means is depending on which platform you're using and which it prioritizes in terms of video versus audio, that can have different problems for different subsets of the disabilities community and deaf people in particular. If it prioritizes audio over video, for example, it then competes with resources trying to show interpreting services. And then if it, if it prioritizes video, it may not show, it may not, prior, it may not uh, show the audio clearly. So these are a couple of other issues to consider. Then there's the idea of censorship of captions. There are some computer al algorithms within automated speech recognition in the captioning system of the platforms where you see the captions and they're either blanked out or it's a series of asterisks and the reader cannot tell if the captioning failed or if the captioning algorithm bleated out, bleeped out an, an expletive that the speaker might have used, for example. That again means there's less accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing people and those reading the captions. That censorship also should be taken out as a feature. If people choose to swear in their presentations, that should be accessible to all participants, including via captioning. So that's a feature that needs to also be looked at. That said, I would very much like to thank Gerard and Brandon for their, comp for their comprehensive presentation. And Gerard said he didn't want me to be disappointed. I have to say, I'm sorry that I am disappointed. And that's because we have insufficient time today for more question and answer. But I do want to say thank you for the new ways of looking at conferences that you've brought to us and the new ways of considering accessibility in those online forums. I think at this juncture, I can pass it back to Lance Robertson, the chair of the Access Board. Lance, over to you. And we have Lance on screen. Mr. Chairman. Okay, please unmute your mic. There we go. Oh. All right. Now I think we're in business. Okay, good. Thank you. Hey, Howard, thanks so much. And um, on behalf of the board, I want to extend my appreciation to Brandon and Gerard for their informative and engaging presentation. Um, as you said, Howard, that was a lot of information. And uh, I think what was provided was very helpful guidance on making sure that virtual events are accessible to everyone. So again, thank you. And we are uh, now gonna to proceed to the board business and reports from members on committee, me uh, committee meetings that took place yesterday. So I will call upon the respective chairs and we'll see if they have any report uh, to share. So let's start with the technical programs committee. Uh, Chris Hart, if you're available and if you have a report, the floor is yours. Chris Hart, are you with us, sir? Okay, we'll move on and we'll circle back in case uh, we, we just are unsuccessful in connecting with Chris and he's on. So let me now go to the ad hoc committee on design guidance. Uh, Karen Brettmeyer is um, the chair of that effort. Karen, if you're on, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lance. Um, 
<clears throat> this is Karen Breitmeyer speaking. At our meeting yesterday, staff provided an update on the progress made to date on the board's guide to the ADA and ABA standards. This work is focused on completing the remaining bulletins um, on chapter six of the standards, which covers plumbing elements and facilities. The bulletins will address lavatories and sinks, washers and dryers, saunas and steam rooms. They will join the bulletins the board released last year on drinking fountains, toilet rooms, and bathing facilities. The project team has completed a draft of the bulletin on lavatories and sinks, which is currently under internal review by staff. The team is working to complete a draft of the bulletin on washers and dryers and plans to finalize text and images in coming weeks. It will then proceed to draft text and finalize images for the bulletin on saunas and steam rooms. Staff will present drafts of the bulletins on washers and dryers and saunas and steam rooms at the March meeting. Since they are completed and clear, or excuse me, once they are completed and cleared internally, all three bulletins will be circulated together to board members and liaison staff for review. And that concludes my report. All right, Karen, this is Lance. I can't get my video to work, which is okay. You've all seen my handsomeness already. So uh, now I wanna go ahead and uh, take it to Matt McCullough and see if the budget committee has a report for today. Matt, the floor is yours, sir. Good, good afternoon, Lance, and all the rest of you. Happy 2021. So, um, so as you may know, the X board was given a budget of nine million two hundred thousand dollars for fiscal year twenty twenty one. We start out the year on a on a CR, which meant that the X board members and staff were spending money on the very very on the very conservative matter. Um, however, President Trump um signed a bill that allowed the X board to obtain the full nine million two hundred thousand dollars on December twenty seventh. So, so, so that's a good thing for the X board going forward. Um, in terms of FR twenty two, um, the the X board staff submitted three different budgets to OMB back. Um, during the first quarter of fiscal year 2021 um and and in terms of submitting these three budgets we are currently waiting to hear back from the office of management and budgets knowing that there's a new administration coming into office on january 20th um traditionally um the new administration has been given the authority to dictate or to give the authority of how much money each, each agency receives. So, so once, so once um, the new administration comes in, um, the export is expecting anywhere between the current low funding of nine million two hundred thousand dollars, or to the um, or up to ten million two hundred. $34,500, that's $10,234,500. So we're still waiting to find out how much money the X Board may receive for, for fiscal year 2022. But right now we're right on target of spending our money for this year. And so, um, so I want to thank the X Board staff and the public members for being on top of it. And so 
Was that in Molly Lance? That is Molly Report at this time? Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. I understand that Chris Hart is with us, so let me circle back to Chris and see if he can share a report from the uh, Technical Programs Committee. If the host could unmute uh, Chris, the floor is yours. Chris, the uh, host says you're unmuted now. We see you. Why I brought up the notion of having a dedicated page. Okay. You know. All right, Chris, host says you're um, open in Zoom, but we still can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Let's see if we can get that worked out. And while we're working on that, let's uh, let's go ahead and jump to Pat. Pat Cannon, if you're with us on a planning and evaluation committee, sir. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. That's good. When I was trying before, the message I got in my ear said, the host will not allow you to unmute yourself. But that's... Uh, yeah. So I'm not the only one that encountered that. Anyway, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to reveal uh, briefly the work of the Planning and Evaluation Committee. We met yesterday and, and discussed and pre produced some resolution on interesting topics, such as automated vehicles and uh, setting topics for the next couple of access board meetings. And finally, our strategic plan. Frances Spiegel will have the uh, greater detail as she delivers the rest of the story. Frances. Thank you, Pat. Um, yesterday, the Planning and Evaluation Committee met and discussed plans for the board's virtual public programming for 2021. Staff reviewed the board's plans for its upcoming series of virtual public information sessions on integrating accessibility into the design of autonomous vehicles which is planned in partnership with the Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, the Department of Transportation, and the Administration for Community Living. The four-part series will provide an open forum where members of the public and stakeholders can discuss considerations, challenges, and solutions in designing autonomous vehicles that are inclusive of everyone. The first in this series of virtual meetings will be held on March 10th in conjunction with the next public meeting of the Access Board. Additional sessions will be held on March 24th, Mar April 7th, and April 21st. Each live session will be followed by a continued discussion on an online crowdsourcing platform. The committee also discussed topics for public presentations to be held at future 2021 public board meetings. Staff will review board member suggestions and present a schedule to the committee at the March meeting. Finally, staff advised the committee that the first draft of the Access Board Strategic Plan for 2022 through 2026 will be due to the Office of Management and Budget in June. The Planning and Evaluation Committee expects to engage in strategic planning for the agency at upcoming meetings. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the report. And Mr. Chairman, that's the truth. That's the long and the short of the Planning and Evaluation Committee report for, the, for right, today. Pat. Thank you, Pat. We know you staked your name on that. We appreciate yeah. that to both you and Francis. Thank you so much. And, and no, Mr. Mr. Chair, while I still have the mark, microphone, I just want to say to you how much we have enjoyed your leadership as our chair over the last few years. You have been engaged, involved, and it's obvious you care about what we do, and that is tremendously appreciated. Well, thank you, Pat. That means a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think Chris um, was signing out and signing back in. Oh, I see him now. Let's see if we have audio. Chris, can we hear you, sir? Uh, hello. All right. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, and, and to reiterate what Pat said, we are going to miss you. Perhaps, uh, and we hope that we will still be in touch going forward with you. 
I think we are also excited to have one of our own board members touching now as the youth director. It is really exciting. And it marks a new chapter for the board. So, moving on to technical programs. We met yesterday, Tuesday afternoon, to discuss the board's training and technical assistance programs, the external coordination with codes and standards organization, as well as to get a brief update on the ongoing study on the feasibility a wheelchair securement systems on aircraft. Last fiscal year, uh, we provide, we say, leave it at that now. During the first quarter of fiscal year 2021, we trained nearly 3,900 people at the increase of almost 650 people compared to 2020 first quarter. Additionally, in the first quarter of FY21, we are now promote, we are now providing remote interpreting and casting for every webinar. Um, as most people are aware the board works very closely with model code groups and standard setting organizations around the world. That provides the board with an update of our work with both ASTM for play area services as well as both Yes, the A-117, the A-117 working group, of which Karen Brickmeyer is helping to lead one of them, is working on accessible building facilities, accessible toileting and building, and another working group on adult changing tables. Always also address scoping. Staff also provide an update of progress on the World Wide Web Consortium on the website 2.2 updates and the 3.0 draft, uh, which I'm sure I thought it really was on from, from WBC. I uh, would be glad to know that the board is excited to see the continuing progress on WCAG. Finally, the staff updated us on the ongoing study of the feasibility of wheelchairs to killing systems on board aircraft. So that people like myself could remain in their wheelchairs on flights. The research committee will continue to work on this project throughout 21 and it's asked to publish the final report on time by the end of September 21. Uh, and that is the long and short of my report. So with that, I will hand it back to you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thanks, Chris. Great report. I appreciate it. Our final report comes to us from Mark Guthrie on um, Election Assistance Commission activities. Mark? Thank you, Lance. Um, uh, and I too want to uh, thank you, Lance, for uh, your service. Um, you have been a really excellent uh, federal chair, and I 
uh, want you to know I'm personally grateful for your service to the board. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The The board has uh, two members who serve on the uh, Elections Assistance Commission's Board of Advisors and its Te Technical Guidelines Development Committee. And now that uh, Sashin is our Executive Director, um, we are pleased to have Pat J Cannon uh, join us uh, by way of your appointment uh, as a board representative to the EAC. Uh, as you would expect, the last quarter has been busy time of the year for the EAC staff and the election officials that constitute the ESC uh, Board of Advisors and the Technical Guidelines Development Committee. That said, I just uh, attended a quarterly meeting of the uh, Board of Advisors this afternoon. On the call, we received agency updates from Commissioners Thomas Hicks and Benjamin Hovland and the ESC Executive Director uh, Mona Harrington. The Board of Advisors uh, is looking forward to a productive 2021. In today's meeting, I want to just particularly say that the leadership of the EAC uh, recognized the um, uh, tremendous job by election officials uh, uh, during the election cycle and the challenges of 2021, uh, or excuse me, 2020. Um, uh, ahead, we will be looking at the development and the promulgation of the accessibility guidelines for uh, voting systems known as VVSG 2.0. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Unless there are questions, that concludes my report. All right. Thank you, Mark, very much. Appreciate that report. Uh, that does conclude our reports. And um, I think with that, we'll go ahead and pivot to new business. So at this point, what I'd like to ask if there are any members um, who have any new business to bring before the U.S. Access Board, please indicate by doing so um, in the chat room. We'll give that a minute. And I do not see any hands. Thank you, Rosemary. Appreciate that. Okay, so if there's no new business, then um, again, you guys have uh, been gracious with your comments, your um, your very kind thoughts about my role as chair. Thank you, and I can tell you how grateful I am for the experience. It's been an honor to serve as the chair, not once but twice. Uh, and certainly, my knowledge of the U.S. Access Board was limited coming in, but now I'm highly, highly impressed as I leave uh, with the impact of what I know the U.S. Access Board does each and every day. And I wish more Americans were aware. I believe that uh, the Access Board punches above its weight class. So, you know, my thanks to the UAB staff as I transition out, uh, certainly to the UAB board as well. I hope you'll just keep serving honorably and support the needs of this organization and be the biggest champion and cheerleader and advocate in 2021. And uh, thankfully, I'll still be in the Aging and Disability Network and uh, certainly will be happy to share all of that information next week and I will remain a big fan and supporter. So uh, the board will hold its next meeting on March 10th as has been shared a couple of times during this meeting. And uh, on March 10th, uh, that will feature a public forum on accessibility to autonomous vehicles. So we certainly hope that um, you will make plans to join us. So with that, that concludes our business for today. And I am curious if there is a motion to adjourn and please indicate through the raise your hand feature. And that would be an alt Y on the keyboard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that is a Deborah Ryan. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Deb Ryan. Do we have a second? Uh, same process, please. Second. Second by Victor Pineda. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you, Rosemary. So with that, then we are adjourned. Um, happy 2021 to all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, interpreters, and thank you, court reporter. The Access Board meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>